Thank you, Doctor. Uh, it's greetings to you all. Uh, it's uh, an honor to present my topic in the International League Conference 2021. Let me directly go to my screen. Is it visible right now? Yes, sir. Yes. So my topic is, is called the key compromised in forensic DNA. So we all of, uh, know that 362 DNA extrorations in US. So basically, how did these 362 innocent DNA get there? So how they were wrongly convicted? So there are some issues there. So reform criminal justice policies, we need robust guidelines and robust analysis and what went wrong, how it can be prevented. So DNA technology is so advanced today, but there are a lot, lot of uncertainty or wrong, wrongful convictions are there. So our top priority to improve the accuracy and reliability of forensic DNA. So iatrogenesis, or most of you heard about it in medical system, what is that? Actually, in a patient is going to a hospital and approaching a doctor and is prescribing a medicine or a treatment after that, he is not or she is not having 100% confirmation that whether the patient is going to cure or not. So it is either because of the, the competency of the doctor or the medical system or the instrument which we, he used for his, his examinations. So this is actually right now it is in place. But the same thing which is happening, uncertainty of forensic DNA typing or iatrogenesis, I don't know how you can use this term or not. So there is no guarantee. So we know that the process which start from crime scene, evidence collection, uh, storage, preservation, analysis, then we are going and submitting the samples to the crime lab, then presenting the evidence to court. But how many forensic DNA experts can guarantee they can provide justice to the victim? So there is no guarantee because that's the reason there were 362 exonerations in the US. So there is a mystery of DNA transfer. How the DNA is getting there in the crime scene or the evidence. So how many DNA experts can say how or where the DNA was deposited there? Answer, it depends. Are we dealing with body fluid right now? No, we are also dealing with touch DNA or trace DNA. So how many of us are confident that the sample is pure and it has not been mixed with other sources of DNA evidences? So do we have a full profile or a major contribution DNA in the profile? So if yes, we can attribute the DNA body fluid that is detected. So in biological evidence process, which is in basically in DNA analysis, crime scene to court, we have several steps, crime scene investigation, crash in, crash out. This is what is happening right now. Our crime scene investigation, which is not properly doing the trash, which is coming in the end, the interpretation stage, we all forensic analysts or experts, we are facing mixture profiles. We are getting extra DNA in the profile. So after crime scene investigation, serology, collection, sample storage, how it is stored, whether the sample is stored properly, whether it is collected in a DNA-free or ISO 18385 certified evidence container or packet. So all matters. Oh, sorry. All right. Now we are going to the biology next step, extraction. In the forensic DNA lab, if the extraction environment is properly controlled, the environment is DNA free or not, how many labs can assure these things? Quantitation, 
to optimize the amount of DNA which you are going to add to the PCR kits, whether it is ID Plex, Identifier, Global Filer, Mini Filer, whatever it may be. Are you properly quantifying the DNA samples? Then STR technology where we are detecting the DNA profile. So here you know what has happened during this whole process. When you do the data interpretation, you will may you may getting a lot of artifacts, mixed profile, low profile. Then basically the which is coming to the next step is genetics, the statistical interpretation. The previous speakers mentioned about the importance of the statistical interpretation, likelihood ratio, combined probability, etc. So before that, we have to know what and how we are doing in the DNA analysis. So now we know how much do DNA we need to know or to analyze. So all the multiplex kits is able to generate good profile with very good, very less starting material. So even picograms, we can get good DNA profiles. And how much optimum amount is required for a particular amplification multiplex kit? So that we have to decide in the quantitation stage. So the technology is so, so advanced and what is happening right now, we are actually analyzing or testing very low trace amount of DNA. And along with that, we are adding the substrate DNA or background DNA along with that. So that's why we are getting a lot of touch DNA evidences. And after that, after the analysis, we are getting this three possible out outcomes of evidence examination. One is exclusion, and another is non-exclusion, match or inclusion or inconclusive result. For example, a known sample of a suspect, which is 11, 12 in a particular law set, which is matching with the question evidence sample. So we can exclude, we can include most of the time, which is inconclusive, particularly today, we are actually analyzing with very low profile or low quantity DNA. So let this, let's look at this STR identification pathway, the evidence item, which is you know, a crime scene investigation officer or a forensic analyst is collecting the swab and sending to the lab. So the evidence data, which you are getting and So inferring the, that particular 10, 12 of the peaks and comparing with the known genotypes or the suspect or victim or reference or database samples. So when, when it is matching 10, 12, so we can say whether it is inclusion or not inclusion. So in this case, you can see it's a good profile. So no deletion, peak head balance is perfect. Ratio is perfect, everything is perfect. But in this profile, if it is coming in into a contamination opportunity or a contamination chance, background DNA, which is already present before collecting the sample, which is on the substrate. So which is also added along with the sample and amplified, and we are producing a genotype. And there are a lot of Possible genotypes are there, 10, 11, 10, 12. There are a lot of combinations. So our known genotype, which is not matching with that. So in this case, we are not able to provide a good results because it is inconclusive. And another scenario, which is polluting the DNA evidence, how we are polluting the DNA. The background, which DNA is they already there in the substrate or in the evidence sample. Either a crime scene officer, a forensic analysis, or a lab environment, or a environment, or a you know, contaminated reagent, or a contaminated uh, evidence packaging material, or whatever it may be, contaminated. It's an external DNA added by the scientist, or the analyst, or the investigation officer, or anyone else. So polluting the DNA. This is actually happening right now, and 
contamination, which is the background DNA, which is already a trace DNA, which is present there. So it is also adding minor profiles or minor peaks to the our original DNA sample. So contamination, which can happen, you can see in this image, not the, the analyst or the crime scene officer not wearing any PP, any, anything. So he's collecting, he or she can contaminate the evidence or pollute the evidence. An analyst also in the lab contaminate the evidence. And we are getting the evidence data the same. We are getting a mixture profile, which we are not able to compare with the known samples. And these are the main problems currently, which is happening in the may, many DNA laboratories or the crime scene investigation units or in their forensic science system, which actually looking for a good DNA profile. Why are the DNA mixtures difficult to interpret? So at the end, the forensic expert, he or she himself or herself knows while they are generating the DNA data at the end. Before that, we do not know what is happening. And we do not know the quantity of each component in the mixture. And which can lead uncertainty in determining if all alleles are present. We have good technologies, we have good uh, scientists, we have good academicians, we have a lot of research and development, everything is there. But the entire system, there are some uncertainty. That's why acceleration, which is happening, not only in the US and European countries and other part of the world also started this project, Innocence Project. Those who are wrongly convicted based on the DNA set. So where we have to correct this? and how we can correct this. The DNA amount, which is very small, so there would be dropout and drop in. There are very difficult, you know, to interpreting because of the many artifacts and noise, which is also coming along with the small amount of DNA. And stochastic effects, DNA profile quality, and quantitation and optimization of DNA for PCR is very important and pipetting, peak imbalance, sister alleles, loss, loss of data, allele drop, allele drop in everything occurs while we are doing with the, or analyzing with the low amount template DNA. So if you look at this, is this a good DNA profile? Of course it is not because there are peak imbalance are there. So in a peak height ratio, when we are interpreting, it should be, you know, should be 100% in a heterozygous peak. So, but there are certain cutoff values are there. So based upon the lab protocols. So evaluation of peak height ratio is very important in analysis of DNA results. So are we properly analyzing each low say for the proper peak height ratio and how we are interpreting this result. So uncertainty in mixture because of the starter, that is also another issue which is happening right now. So you can see here the allele 12, 14, 15, 16, the total RFU of the allele you can see. And the 14 and 15, so the starter peak is masked with the alleles, the proper alleles. So that, that actually varies the peak height RFU. So here is, there is a problem. So the, uh, the peak height ratio imbalance it is not correct because of the starter. And the starter you can see clearly see from this profile. So you can see the small peaks, which is the left side of the each long, long peaks. That is the starter. So how you are, you know, interpreting the starter. How are you interpreting the shoulder peaks? That is also very important because this is the peak. The, here you can see there is no optimization in the DNA. So the, P, the, the PCR kits which you are selecting and you have to optimize after the quantitation, calculate how much we require. So according to that only you are getting a good peaks. Pull up peaks, there's another artifacts which is commonly occurs. So when 
you are analyzing the DNA or uh, interpreting the DNA results. So you have to remove all the pull up peaks. This is also another artifacts which is coming. Minus A peaks, this is the another artifacts which you can see in this image. So spikes, this is another issue which is coming normally, which is also affecting our interpretation. And this is generally, which is happening with the, with the instrumentation, how we properly maintain the in instrument, the CE genetic analyzer, are we cleaning properly? Are we, do we have a proper cleaning procedure for the instrumentation? Is our uh, instrument have a cleaning protocol? So everything matters. And this all artifacts really affect our results. This is either because of the contamination or the low template DM. So lab should establish stochastic threshold. So for example, in Indian scenario, the, the many states are doing DNA analysis. Each lab has their own uh, stochastic threshold. And at the end, we are presenting this result to the court. So whether it is sessions court, whether it is high court, whether it is Supreme Court. So do we have a integrated you know, protocol for DNA analysis or the DNA data interpretation? So there is any committee to establish this kind of interpretation or standard operating procedure for each lab. So whether we are you know, integrated together to present the result to the court. So, we each lab should establish a stochastic threshold and you know we should form a committee or a scientific committee to do you know to do some validation or studies to present this into the court challenges in real world data so each allele variations are there in the pcr is highly affected dna quantity and quality so quantity is very important and quality also very Imbalance in allele sample gets worse, the low amounts of DNA template. So that whenever we are going to analyze touch DNA samples at all, so there is, we can expect the imbalance and higher number of contributors. If it is a body fluid, we can say this has come from this particular body fluid because of the quantity is there already. Degra degraded DNA template may, some allele targets are avail unavailable. PCR inhibitors, may also reduce the sample which is collected from a farm. There is a humic acid present in the farm. So that will the soil that will inhibit. A denim genes indigo dye which is present that will inhibit the DNA. So everything matters. So the forensic DNA expert, he should know or she should know about, about the sample and what she or he is going to analyze and how they are going to interpret. Very important. So overlap of alleles from contributors in DNA mixtures, uh, started products, as I mentioned, it is already masking the minor contributor. And it is the trace DNA and uncertainty. Due to the sample quantity, more uncertainty is there. So due to the artifacts, the presence of DNA of more than one person, we call mixtures. Strignant control procedures are needed on the crime scene and in the laboratory. So are we following proper Guide, you know, control measures to not, to not to contaminate the evidence in the crime scene. Are we collecting the samples in a proper DNA free containers or vials or the, or the forensic medicine? And are they sub, you know, submitting the samples in proper way? So do we have a proper evidence management or you know, quality management system in place? Is our crime scene is ISO 17020 accredited? accredited or our lab is ISO 17025 accredited. So all this matters. So we can you know, know the DNA experts know the results at the end only. So we face a lot of you know, mixture, you know, we are getting a lot of mixture samples. And so most of the time we can give the result to the court or that it is an inconclusive result because of the mistakes which is happening from the beginning. So we have to control these things. 
So evolution given to a source level proposition is not the same as given the activity level proposition. So many, um, the activity level is very important. So the, the source, the innocent DNA must might be present in the source or the substrate. The activity level, we should know about this. Well, and what is happening, then only we can you know, create a you know, judgment out of it. So detection of contamination, that is very important. Comparison of DNA profile generated from items against database of reference DNA profiles from personal from whom this, there is a significant risk of contamination. So whether a police officer who is visiting the crime scene, he may contribute his DNA to the crime scene. So are we collecting the elimination data of the, all the people with, with those who are present in the crime scene? Do we, we have a system like that? We have to think about it. Cross-checking the profiles within the same batch of samples with, from different batches of samples processed within the same laboratory. If there is any contamination which is reported, so all that batch samples might be you know, contaminated, whether it is from a reagent, so a sample reagent extraction buffer, which is contaminated, who knows it? So maybe from the centrifuge, because with the other case sample, it is contaminated. So we are getting a mixture sample or an inconclusive result. Investigation of unexpected results. So we are getting unexpected result every time we have to investigate back to find the root cause of it. Segregation of the processing of casework and reference DNA samples. So already there is a system in place. We have to have a crime sample that, you know, lab and a reference sample lab. And one scientist or analyst working on the same sample, which is not advised. Segregation of pre-polymerized chain reaction and the post-PCR should be segregated. Staff may only transfer from post area to the pre area in the same day if the work shower and they change their outer clothing. If the, if, for example, the staff the same day, he is going to the post PCR, that is the C instrument, which is there. And we are going back to the PCR area, whether it is extraction or pre PCR area, it is not allowed if you are going, so you should take a shower or change your clothing. Why? Because you are carrying the amplified DNA to the extraction area uh, to another case. Segregation between bulk and trace items at any stage of their examination and processing. So segregation, we have to do with the bulk and trace samples. So trace sample, uh, samples or touch DNA samples, you should not take along with the high quality or high quantity DNA. Prevention of lab contamination, minimizing the chance of contamination occurring by example, staff using barrier clothing, PPE should be a must. Restriction access to areas containing exhibits. So those who are coming to take exhibits, maybe a, a PUN or the office assistant or a lab assistant, all should you know, register their log there. So who touches the evidence, that is very important. Cleaning laboratory surfaces, that is also very important. Weekly, monthly cleaning protocol should be in place. Rendering consumables from uh, ISO 19385 certified DNA free. Even many labs or many agencies which I have seen, they have the uh, normal, the, the common collection kits. You know, they, that all kits we cannot guarantee about the presence of DNA is there or not. You might heard about the fandom of Heli Burton. So the staff who worked in a manufacturing unit of a swab, so uh, they, he or she contaminated the sample or the, all the cases. So that is very important. So we must procure very good uh, DNA free consumables, kits and you know, samples. Ensuring the equipment used at scenes of crime adequately decontaminated between scenes. Is there any system in place to you know, check the contamination of the crime scene uh, tools or equipments? Are we doing that? I don't think so. Uh, many of the agencies are doing this. 
So are, are we checking the tools frequently? It's a once in a month or you know, once in four months, just randomly take crime scene you know, equipment and tools and check. You can get a lot of DNA on that particular tools. So a crime scene investigation officer is going to collect and use the same tool or equipment to collect, you know, collect another case sample that automatically, you know, automatically contaminate the other case. So wear gloves, change them off, often. Always use disposable instruments or clean them thoroughly before and after handling each sample. So maybe sometimes the normal uh, decontamination you know, reagents might not work. So you have to check. So validate which are the uh, present you know, decontaminating reagents which you are using, whether it is chlorex. Dr. Or Joseph, please, yes. please, please bind up as soon as possible. No? Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Okay. Avoid talking, sneezing, coughing over evidence. Avoid touching your face, nose, that all of you know because of the COVID situation or we are well aware how the cells are transferred. Air dry evidence before packing. So competence of personnel is very important. Crime scene officer competence and lab uh, analysts, education, training, equipment, consumables, uh, facilities, equipment, kits validated, properly stored. Collection, DNA analysis, reporting, so written SOP with ISO 17025 accreditation is very, very important. So all labs should you know, actually go for this accreditation process. Scientifically validated protocol standards should be you know, uh, there and nationwide and overseas, you know, overseeing committee in DNA should be established very soon. So with this, I will wind up uh, the presentation here. So we all forensic DNA, uh, analysts or you know students or enthusiasts so we all are going to work with the specimens which is forensic specimens which is imperfect specimens so we should know the art of working with that so for that we need more trainings and you know support system so system only helps you to develop the proper good dna profile which is not going to you know in future not going to allow the wrongly conviction wrong wrongful convictions in the future thank you very much